welcome to all the panelists and to all the attendees. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 2020 Hawaii Book and Music Festival. A little bit different this year than in past years and so we're glad that you've all joined us. My name is Laura Thielen and I'm the Executive Director of Partners in Care which is a resource program that supports all the service, all those homeless service providers on the island of Oahu. So I will start off with Philip Garbadin. Philip is the Endowed Hawaii Community Reinvestment Corporation Professor in Affordable Housing Economics, Policy, and Planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa serving in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning and the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization, also known as UHERO. Go ahead and wave your hand, Philip, so everybody knows which one. There you go. Welcome, oh. Philip. <laughs> Next, we've got Connie Mitchell. Connie Mitchell has been an innovating approaches to homeless solutions through the work of IHS, the Institute for Human Services, for the past 14 years. Some of you may remember when that used to be called the peanut butter ministry years ago. Connie's resume includes clinical experience as a psychiatric advanced practice registered nurse, a minister in parish ministry, program development and healthcare administrator as the director of nursing at the Hawaii State Hospital, and establishing rural mental health clinics on the island of Hawaii as a faculty at the University of Hawaii. A passion for social justice and personal empowerment informs her work and strategies for ending homelessness. Thank you, Connie, for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Kimo Carvalho. He is the executive director of Lydia House, a Lilio Kalani Trust Youth Services Center serving minors and young adults who are in crisis and in need of support systems to become thriving Native Hawaiians. The Trust is a private operating foundation established 111 years ago by Hawaii's last reigning monarch, Queen Liliokalani, who left her estate to serve in perpetuity orphan and destitute children of Hawaiian ancestry. Lydia's House is part of the Trust's expanded strategies direction to serve the most vulnerable and disadvantaged Native Hawaiian youth overrepresented in Hawaii state systems, including homelessness, juvenile justice, and foster care. Thank you, Kimo, for joining us today. And with that, we're going to have a discussion today about the impacts of COVID-19 on those who are the most vulnerable in our community, those who are experiencing homelessness and houselessness. And we'll be looking ahead to how we're going to be reshaping our response to this issue of COVID in the years to come. We're gonna start off with Connie. Uh, would you like to give an opening statement and start with your PowerPoint presentation, Connie? So um, I just wanted to kind of start with um, this word pivoting in my title. I think that, um, that kind of speaks to the immense need to quickly change what we're doing and um, you know quickly find some new solutions. Uh, for, for me, these are the five things that I see is that uh, right now as a shelter provider, we're living with a constant threat of con the contagion. Uh, just today, you know, we had a, another person turn positive in our Kapuna dorm and we had to really mobilize to get the others that were exposed out and uh, do that in many different ways. Uh, the comorbid conditions that a lot of homeless people experience, the uh, mental illness, the substance abuse, those are very, very expensive sometimes to um, deal with and we're gonna have to find some new models for that. And then of course, um, we also don't have a lot of behavioral health workforce to deal with that. Um, we also know that um, with the impact on the economy, we're gonna have a lot less funds you know, to really work with. And so we're really anticipating a lot of that and thinking about how we can change the models of service delivery uh, by lastly, you know, using some of the advances in technology um, to aid our service delivery. But even when we were uh, really doing this uh, six foot apart CDC guideline, we still experienced um, 
the uh, spread of some of the virus so that we had to end up quarantining um, in the month of August, uh, mid-August to mid-September. So these are other ones that are kind of emerging models right now. Um, this one on the left is our Halemaliola uh, container um, retrofitted for couples and for individuals and for pets and for people that you know just really don't want to be split up. So um, one container divided in two can serve you know either an ADA person, two ADA people or two couples, and others are divided to three and they serve three individual people. The one in the middle is the is called the shelter that is operated by um, the um, First Assembly of God in Kahalu. It's a, it's a really pretty um, area. And these are made out of uh, dome structures that are very, very um, solid, but um, again, easy to take apart, easy to move, and they create you know, some really nice spaces for people for shelter. And these are actually serving single moms with children. On the uh, far left, you know, we have uh, this newest tiny home that was donated to our Halemaliola site to IHS, and um, it's a two-story little building, and it really um, is a very nice little um, compact housing for someone, and uh, right now it's occupied by one person, but it could easily um, be used for two people with an outside um, stairwell. These are some future models that I just wanted to share with people that you know we're looking at. The left is a capsule hotel, which is um, two of them actually, where people just have a place to sleep. And then the other um, amenities are of course um, shared, the bathrooms, the cooking facilities and common areas. And um, on the right, you know, is another uh, type of space, you know, where, um, you know, we're looking at uh, si uh, single room occupancy type buildings. We don't have a lot of those in Hawaii, unfortunately, but I think in a lot of other urban cities, they've been um, converting a lot of those to shelter. We would like to actually see more um, either built or uh, redeveloped here in Hawaii. We also um, you know, looked into what we call internet cafes, which are commonly used in Japan and some other Southeast Asian countries. Those are places where people can actually um, uh, you know, be using a service, but not be um, necessarily in what is considered like a room, you know, where typically they would be um, sleeping, but they do, you know, end up renting the space for um, the internet, but then they also end up maybe falling asleep over there. So um, this one is about what I mentioned about facilitating service delivery. So the left hand um, picture is um, the post. It is the provisional outdoor triage and screening center that the Honolulu Police Department is operating out at Ke'ehi Lagoon right now. These are tents that give people their own space and there are services that are being delivered there um, you know, as um, they're moving in there. So there's a lot of people there, like maybe about um, 80 people that are living there at this time. And there, because they're kind of far away from um, everyone else, we use telehealth in a lot of ways. And we have people who are stationed there to provide the same kind of services that we provide in our other traditional shelters. But I think this is another model that um, maybe uh, people will be thinking about using uh, perhaps a little bit more as well. And telehealth in general um, is something that we've been using with some of our folks who have been housed uh, recently, needing the support of people um, you know, who are normally their case managers or reaching their psychiatrists and doctors. So we also think that, you know, um, as we move forward, we really need to think about subpopulations that need have special needs, among them released offenders, people who need um, mental health treatment, chronically homeless, chronically mentally ill. And then in the center, we have um, people who may be, um, be in training and going uh, forth with new jobs that just need a real small place to live or at, um, below drug treatment and detox for um, residential services. And then on the far right, we have medical respite, which IHS has been really um, putting out more of these houses to help people who have medical vulnerabilities that are coming out of the hospital and those who are coming off the street with the uh, same kind of medical vulnerability also, but providing those um, medical services. So that's it for me. Okay, I wanted to turn it over to Kimo real quick. Uh, Kimo, I know that you had a program that was supposed to start in a couple of months, but when COVID hit, 
um, you folks turned on a dime and um, decided to open your new facility. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, so um, I don't have a PowerPoint. Apologies. I am filling in last minute for the Lieutenant Governor, but um, uh, hopefully everyone knows where Dog the Bounty Hunter used to be. That's probably the, the way to describe the landmark. Um, so Lydia's house was purchased in late 2018 uh, by Lily Ogilvy Trust. And we, um, you know, for the last decade, you know, we were noticing that a lot of our beneficiaries, uh, their children were showing back up to the trust. And, you know, we wanted to really do something about breaking the cycle of poverty for our native Hawaiian population, which is declining in numbers, but also um, is alarmingly number one in all the places we don't want to be number one. You know, we're number one in obesity and healthcare problems, unfortunately, sex trafficking, homelessness, juvenile justice, and foster care and many other systems. So we really wanted to reassess and um, Lydia's House is the first of several innovation, center, innovation centers that would really demonstrate best practices toward um, innovation solution, innovative solutions to basically knowing how to develop uh, social service practices coupled with healthcare and behavioral health uh, to really do what it takes to actually just break the cycle for um, Native Hawaiian youth that are just aging and growing into adulthood that eventually just become high risk for many other systems uh, like public safety and homelessness. It is very hard to execute our traditional programming because, you know, getting to the core of someone's trauma and really um, practicing uh, our cultural programming really is a social setting. So it has just been very challenging to get them to engage virtually and to uh, listen. I, I wanna say it's actually doubled the work um, just to constantly repeat ourselves and constantly try to work with them. Uh, but we're getting creative. Uh, this is the new normal, we understand that and uh, we're doing the best we can. The best thing though is that um, I wanna say, you know, as soon as we got them housing, more than half the issues pretty much went away, you know, they were no longer in crisis. And because like, like I said, these are resilient kids, uh, they were very willing, they were very much will, willing to engage in program services and just doing what it takes. So, you know, I do an, anticipate that they will access permanent housing. They will be at least set up to have the opportunity to thrive. And we plan on working with them um, in years to come just to sort of see what uh, further impacts uh, COVID has on our population moving forward. Great. Thank you, Kima. And that slides right very nicely into what Phil is going to be um, sharing with us. And that's, you know, we will not be able to end homelessness or even put a dent in it if we do not have affordable housing available when they are ready. So with that, I will uh, ask Phil to share his screen and share his thoughts with us. None of these things can serve the neediest people here if residents don't allow us to build any of them, right? Whether we're talking tiny homes or SROs or LIHTC development, low income housing tax credit developments or any of these things, if neighborhood opposition um, reaches a point where we can't do any of it, then, you know, so many of these innovative policies, you know, are sort of fall flat before, um, we even get them underway. And I'm inspired uh, by the recent uh, sort of tragedy up in Kailua where um, a 73 unit affordable housing complex um, that really I felt worked hard to um, you know, avoid any of the negative externalities associated with development um, was ultimately canceled due to community opposition, right? And so that's 73 households now homeless or at risk of being homeless. Um, who aren't going to be able to have have housing, and so I wanted to to sort of think through that a little bit um, and try to understand it. Uh, because this is the Hawaii Book and Music Festival, I thought it would be useful to make some recommendations for great books on these topics. Um, Golden Gates by Connor Daughtry, I think it is, um, talks about the sort of situation of um, development in California. Neighborhood Defenders by Einstein Einstein and others is great. Um, and the segregated by design and zone in the USA are sort of more larger historical backgrounds, but they're all terrific. And in the interest of book and music festival, I, I highly recommend them all. 
I want to also talk, mention early on, right, is that I'm going to be talking about NIMBYism, right, not in my backyard, opposition to development. I'm, it is very important, at least to me, to distinguish that um, from the very legitimate um, and sometimes conflated idea of not in my sovereign nation and struggles for Hawaiian independence and sovereignty, right? I think oftentimes NIMBY folks, and you know, I'm defining NIMBY here as essentially the desire to exclude others, to harm other people, simply to preserve your own economic well-being and position, right? Um, or the belief that this is, right? And that's obviously very different from the good work of anti-displacement struggles and the good work of the sort of struggle for Hawaiian autonomy and sovereignty here. And so as much as I often hear in NIMBY conversations, a desire to um, essentially um, co-opt the language of these other struggles. First two questions are, can we convince households, homeowners, that affordable housing will not lower their property values or disrupt the status quo, right? And you know, I could talk to you for the next 45 minutes about the academic literature suggests that most of the time people even know they're living next to affordable housing once it's been built, never mind it having any sort of measurable impact on their quality of life or their housing. I could show you lots of more equations that um, show that even from researchers who are not necessarily predisposed to that as a political stance. Um, and second, if they won't believe that inference, can we convince them to, you know, if they are going to fundamentally believe that affordable housing is harmful to them in their neighborhoods, can we convince them to be altruistic and say, well, I see the sort of greater good here and I'll do it anyway? You know, my answer to that is I really don't know. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, I'm going to look at questions. Uh, one attendee asked uh, for Phil, you appear to not recognize that a major objection from homeowners is based on the fact that affordable housing proposals are always presented as extremely high density projects that inevitably alter the character of established communities rather than a desire to prevent other persons from obtaining similar opportunities. How can the disparity in architectural desirability be addressed? Um, I do recognize that. Um, and I don't particularly think it's a valid argument against, right? There is always a value in doing things nice architecturally, but so many times arguments around density, around neighborhood character are either sort of euphemisms for opposition to stigmatized groups or they're dust post hoc explanations for why you don't want affordable housing. So I know that the politically feasible thing here is the, you know, feasible answer is to argue that, oh, well, you know, it should be more like, I don't think so. I saw that de development. I saw the plans. I saw the location in Kailua. Anyone who's going to argue that that is going to fundamentally change the neighborhood character for anything but the better is just making up a excuse and yeah, after the fact. Yeah, and I think there's a, like Phil and, and Connie have said, there's a lot of different folks involved in that. One of the issues that seems to be coming up is, you know, we want to make sure that people don't enter into homelessness even to begin with, uh, because that then adds a whole bunch of stressors onto their lives and pushes them into a system that they're not familiar with. And, you know, we're still addressing chronic homelessness, folks who have been homeless for many, many years uh, and have comorbid or trimorbid, you know, multiple issues going on. Uh, you know, how are we, you know, we're along with the CARES funding and, and fundings focused on COVID related situations, what does our future look like at, at actually ending homelessness and actually moving towards some of the, um, the, the diverse ideas that you folks have had, whether it's with Native Hawaiian youth or with the chronically homeless veterans? What are some things that you, you folks would really like to see set in place for the long term beyond COVID? I think for me, I'm just really wanting to focus more on homeless prevention. Um, I think that traditionally IHS has been full on committed to helping people who are chronically homeless and those people who have very complex issues. Um, I think there are a lot of other people um, that can help with um, homeless prevention. 
But I also think that, you know, we really need to be tracking um, from a data perspective, how many people are becoming homeless and how many people are exiting the homeless service system and coming back into the homeless service system and to have that front and center. Because I really believe that you have to focus on who's coming in in order to really make progress. And I really think that we have not been um, so focused on that part because we've really been focused on trying to get a lot of uh, folks out of the homeless service system. But the future has to be about both and it has to be balanced. I think for me, I just wanted to um, end by just sharing that for me, as I watch people emerge out of homelessness, it is when they can develop um, social capital and connect with people who may not be um, experiencing similar things to them and have a way of really reaching out and uh, inviting people to be a part of the greater community that they're able to really make strides and get ahead. And I would really um, you know, want to challenge everyone in our community to think about how you might offer that, you know, and just uh, whether it's one person who is really having a hard time or not, but you know, just really um, being open and really creating those kinds of neighborhoods that really, um, you know your neighbor, you can connect with them and help them if they're experiencing something um, you know, challenging at the moment. What are the perceptions of the homeless and the newly houseless on the causes of homelessness and houselessness? Do they blame themselves or have a larger perspective? You know, I wonder if Kimo can, can just talk to that. Um, do, do your uh, young folks, do they see themselves as homeless and houseless or are they young and invincible or what are some of the perspectives your youth have? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, I think there definitely is this stigma of feeling different, and that does um, exacerbate the trauma. Um, you know, I think that they recognize that you know opportunities are limited, and I think that part of breaking the cycle for for anyone is to really dream of futures and possibilities that is beyond the, the external lifestyles that they see on a day to day basis. Um, I think that when they start to recognize that those are possibilities, their perceptions do change um, and that we can build, you know, some pathways toward, you know, some future that they want to um, strive toward. So that's, you know, I think the best way to answer that. Um, and I guess um, I'll probably just take this moment to um, kind of wrap up my final thoughts. You know, I think that um, if there is a book out there, um, you know, uh, Lily Okalani Trust was a sponsor for uh, the Queen's Journals that recently just got uh, published and released. And it's, um, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, thinking about uh, our Queen, Lily Okalani, you know, she, in 1881, she did actually face the smallpox e epidemic. And actually, that is what resulted in her um, her will, her trust to actually dedicating all her life possessions and land in the state to serving Hawaii's orphan and destitute. And when I think about that, you know, her response was bold. It was not popular. Uh, she did not get along with businesses and, uh, but she really had the political will to make sure that children had housing, had stability, and, and we got through that. So I really do think that, you know, as I really think of a book um, that, you know, it's, it's very hard to read, but it is very inspirational. Um, and it is something that has really grounded me this year amongst these challenges. And I think that, um, you know, I look forward to seeing uh, from my colleagues, you know, what is possible. And I know that COVID is going to change a lot, but we're all in this and we're going to try to make the best out of it. Mm -hmm.